do you know those from? Caiaphas was the judge over um, Jesus. Yes. Uh, but uh, was he a Sadducee or a Pharisee? So he's a Pharisee. Oh, I mean, okay. a Sadducee, excuse Sadducee. me. Sadducee. So there, okay. Yes, so Annas and Caiaphas were Sadducees. So um, Annas was appointed as high priest. Now I wish I could remember. Did I? Why didn't I write it down? I wish I'd written it down. He had been appointed to be a high priest um, a long, long time before, and he served as high priest for a long period of time. And then his he had, I think, four or five sons, and they served as high priests. And Caiaphas, who was the one, wasn't Caiaphas the one at the trial of Jesus? Who said, yeah, you are at the trial of Jesus. You understand nothing. It is expedient that one man die instead of the whole nation. You see that collaboration with Rome coming out? Like, hey, if we don't go along with this and we start a rebellion, Rome's going to destroy us all. So that's, that's why he has to die. Not realizing spiritually, as the high priest, he was speaking God's own truth that one man Jesus would die in place of the whole nation but Caiaphas was the son-in-law of Annas the high priest so he was he was the high priest at the time that Jesus was crucified but Annas was a powerful figure so he's right he's mentioned there and he's right there with with everything John we think might be Jonathan who was one of the sons of Annas who became high priest when Caiaphas finished his high priesthood. And this fellow Alexander, we don't have any idea who, who that is. But So who are the men that are getting together now to, to quiz Peter and John? All the big shots in the um, in the high priest family. Yeah, these are, these are the big shots. Remember Jesus telling the people in the Gospels that you will be you will be brought up before rulers and do not think beforehand what you are to say for in that very hour the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say so we're seeing the things that Jesus predicted and talked about coming to pass in the book of Acts again and again so here's just one example of that so verse 7 when they had set them in the midst they inquired by what power or by what name did you do this? Do, do what? Who remembers? Do what? Cure the lame man. They cured the lame man. And there's no doubt about it because that lame man was by that gate every day. So everybody saw him. Everyone knew he was lame. And everyone now, this is a miracle that they're not trying to hide this. And I said, well, this is, um, this, this is misinformation. No, there's none of this really <laughs> Everybody knows it. Now they're trying, by, by what power or name did you do it? So then Peter, as Jesus predicted, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, um, let's, why don't we take a look at uh, Luke, Luke 21. There it is. Luke 21. Would someone read um, verses 14 and 15? Settle it therefore in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. All right. So everything Jesus predicted is, is we see happening in the life of the, of the church. Um, when it says that Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit, now here I have to, uh, I have to defer to um, one of the one of the commentators that I looked at. Um, I, I told you my um, my my Greek is weak and my Hebrew's askew, so I I know just enough to be dangerous. And um, even though I'm not proficient in Greek and Hebrew, it's very valuable to me because I can at least follow the arguments of commentators that dig in more deeply and use the original languages. So I would not have realized this myself from the grammar, but he pointed out something that um, this being, Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit is an air of, air, aorist passive participle. Um, so it's speaking about this particular event. 
So it's not as though Peter wasn't always filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a sense in which he was always filled with the Holy Spirit. Once Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, um, as, as it does for us now in our, our baptisms, right? But he was filled in a particular way. He was filled in a special way for the work of God. Have you ever experienced that? So you have the Holy Spirit. When does the Holy Spirit leave you? When you're sleeping? Does he, would he leave you if you were in a coma? Um, does, he, does he leave you if you're, you skip church and you're sinning that day playing golf or something? <laughs> when does this Holy Spirit leave you? Never. Never. Ne never. But do you have times in your life sometimes too where you can sense a, a, a special, unique filling? I, I don't know how we can describe We're using We're using spatial analogies to describe something that defies time and space, but you, you, the Holy Spirit came upon you in a particular way, and you were maybe sharing with someone, and, and you knew the Lord was helping you, or you were praying for someone, and you, the words just started to flow out of you, or you were singing, and, and your heart just all of a sudden pushed the music to a new level. The Holy Spirit does this in unique, in unique ways for people. So that's what's happening to, to Peter. Here and he so he addresses them, rulers of the people and elders. Verse nine. If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, he look how he throws that in there. You crucified. Whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. Just, just in that opening phrase, first of all, what do you see? He's boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus. He's not ashamed, even though he's been arrested. He's in danger. Um, he mentions whom you crucified. Now, who, who crucif for whom was Jesus crucified? All of us. All of us. So there's a sense in which because of all of our sins, Jesus was crucified. But he's not letting them off the hook here. He's not saying um, whom the Romans crucified or some, whom you crucified. So he, it's necessary that they accept their responsibility for, for this. We, we can't come to Christ until we recognize we're the ones that, that crucified him. So he's, he's not taking them off the hook in the slightest. And whom God raised from the dead. That, that stirred them, I'm sure. They were furious at this. They did not like that one bit. By, by him, this man is standing before you well. So the man is standing there, by the way. So the crippled man is present at this, at this hearing. Um, verse 11. Oh, boy. we got to spend a lot of time on verse 11 and 12. And we don't have a lot of time. I'm just going to read it and hopefully give you the, the kind of the what your appetites for this, all right? So this this one or this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you the builders which has become the cornerstone. So we've got a whole bunch of scriptures I want us to look at about this idea of Christ being the cornerstone. And verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So well, my my um, doctor of ministry project um, was on the challenge of religious pluralism to Christian particularist chaplains, military chaplains. Um, so look, looking at how a Christian like me who believes that you have to have faith in Jesus to be saved, how do we do, do ministry with people where part of our job is to help them practice their own religion by which they will not be saved, right? It's kind of like buying cigarettes for a kid under age, right? You're, you're, you're helping them kill themselves. And you, so how do, how do you do that? So I worked for seven years on that project. So needless to say, I got a lot to say about this verse. <laughs> this is a really big verse. Um, that we as Christians, our starting point is that there is salvation under no one else. So, can a, can a Hindu be saved if they're a sincere Hindu? No. Not according to this. Can a Muslim be saved, you know, if they're a sincere Muslim? 
not according to this. Can someone who never heard of Jesus, they, they grew up on some island in the South Pacific, they never heard of Jesus. They never had a chance to believe the gospel. But in their own way, they're trying to be a good person. Can they be saved? Not according to this verse. We, we've got to understand and take this in fully and realize what this, what this means. So we'll spend more time on it next, next week. So thank you all for being here. God, God bless you. You made it. You made it. Agree to disagree. Yeah, there's no agree to disagree on this. In the event you were talking about the Messianic Kingdom, uh, you're, that would be the New Testament era plus what is to come, or is it one or the other? Yes, I think the way you just said it. So Jesus has begun, or the the, the word we like to use is inaugurated, meaning it started with Jesus, but it's not consummated. So all the aspects of it, the fullness of it, is not yet. That, that will be in the future.